to all the questions that you've always wanted to ask but were afraid to until now, um, to our panel of experts. I'm going to invite Alec to come down. He's, he's back there, Alec Kiros and um, Helen Keegan and Lee Graveswolf. And as they come down, uh, think of the questions you want to ask them. Think, want to put them on the spot. If you want to, you know, if there have been burning issues that have kind of inspired you or annoyed you or, or, or intrigued you in some way uh, that you've thought about at this conference, maybe it's something they've said in their presentations. Maybe it's something that's been discussed over coffee. Maybe it's something that um, has just been... Uh, thought of by you as, you as you've been sat there listening, okay? Um, I'm going to pass the mic around to each of them as, as, um, as you ask the questions. Um, who's got the first question for the panel? That would be good if we've got two mics, that's great. Who, who's got, uh, right over here, so Ian, um, I'll, I'll give the mic to you. Thanks. Um, uh, Ian, I have a question for Helen. Uh, I was uh, intrigued and delighted with your presentation yesterday but I, I work in, with primary schools and secondary schools, and I was just trying to work out, um, is there a re, uh, replicatable framework uh, for uh, what you've done that can be done in, in, in schools? Um, I think it's not just educational learning, it's been many educational learning. Um, one thing that I would like to say is that there was something quite difficult about We had a restricted group of people, so what we actually did was put principles of our design and apply them to rules for a game. So it wasn't actually what I would term a genuine arc. So I'd like to make that clear at the start. Um, I also said in the talk that I did want to do it differently. I wanted to distinguish it from educational arcs. Um, I didn't want it to feel like it was educational at all. I wanted it to feel like it was something to do with big and small media, something confusing in a confused space. Um, which does kind of represent what's going on in that world at the moment in terms of social media use, journalistic content, big media control, etc. Um, I think all of those principles in terms of the actual game design can be transferred to any context. In terms of game design, ethics and ethical issues, you've got a different matter again entirely. So I think that's the answer I give to that. Does that answer the question at all? Or? Go on, do part B. <laughs> yeah, it, it, was, it was the sense of uh, mystery and excitement mm, mm. Uh, and intrigue, yeah. um, that part of, the, yeah. uh, of the, the sort of thing that you developed, and I wonder whether that could be sort of replicated oh, uh, in, uh, yeah. in other things. So perhaps I'll talk yeah. to you afterwards. <laughs> Actually, of um, Jane McGonagall, who does work in games, uh, recently was commissioned by the New York Public Library to do an ARG uh, around digital collections. And so, I mean, that's a very educational application where they were invited to the library for this mystery and they ended up cataloging 500 items that would have taken years for the librarians and archivists to do. In 24 hours, they archived all these items, created a book, and that book was then published and printed that day at the library and then put on the shelves. So there's ways that these things can be repurposed definitely in the, the K-12 or younger settings. It's worth looking at, um, sorry. Um, Educores, I think um, you'll probably find some really good links and resources there for sort of K-12 and below. Other questions? I've got a question for, for all of you. I'll start with Alec, actually. Um, it's, it's, it's quite a big question. It's a big picture question. What, what, what do you consider to be the biggest barriers to good learning? Oh, <laughs> that's a big one. Um, I want to go back to Helen's, um, actually, because when she was talking about how she didn't want to make things seem very educational, and we've often talked about educational games, like the ones that you can get at the supermarket or that sort of thing that are actually called educational games and those are usually the worst games at all and I think one of the biggest parts of it is is moving things beyond the realm of education and into the real world so I think that is really such a huge thing that we move what well, we move ahead um, de-educationalize education in a sense yeah. not corporatize education but make it so much more I mean recognizing <laughs> informal learning so much like that 
that kid yesterday that I showed who's learning on YouTube and had just basically, this is what I know and this is what I need or seek to know and I'm hoping that you can help me in my learning. That's such a basic idea around education. So in terms of that, recognizing, we, we I mean, informal learning, non-formal learning have always existed and just bringing that to the fold into education, recognizing it more so. And of course, um, with that, the decredentialization of some of this and, and um, uh, bringing in uh, a, a different aspect of what, how, how universities look at it. And just, just the last thing I'll mention, as David Wiley a while back recognized there were four reasons why um, people go to school or to universities. So there's the credit, there's the socialization aspect, there is the content itself. Um, see if I can remember all four. The content itself and, uh, oh, and the support. So there are four things, but support is all over everywhere. Content is, there's nothing left. I mean, content's everywhere, it's abundant. Um, the, uh, uh, the, the really, the big one is the credit. And so if, if universities are only there to support uh, the, the cred credit or the credentialization, what does that mean for the rest of it? So really th rethinking what universities do or higher, edu higher education or K-12, what it actually does. I, um, I think I addressed some of that is the fear, um, at least especially when teaching adults. I see that as a huge barrier and um, this idea of if something doesn't work, I'm just going to stop and move to something else. I'm going to do what I'm good at. So it's reinstilling, I th think, a sense of that wonder and play uh, that, due to so many different political, social factors in classrooms, teachers aren't allowed to do. So I think that's a huge barrier right now in, in empowering the teachers. And a lot of that is happening via uh, Twitter and socially to, to push back to push back against that. <laughs> um, I think I'd add to that um, an imposed curriculum, basically. Um, we do have curricula. They are important in terms of, you know, disciplinary, epistemological skills and knowledge. But fundamentally, I think there are ways to get learners to love and explore curricula um, and, you know, give them a much more kind of, um, yeah, much more agency, I guess, in their own learning journey. Other questions? Something that's intrigued you or annoyed you, inspired you? <laughs> uh, ad hominem, I think. Ad hominem, I think that's called, isn't it? <laughs> um, it's, it's a serious question, isn't it? You, what, what is the thing that really annoys you the most? Um, Assessment. When you say assessment, you're talking, I'm assuming, about yeah, assessment I mean, for um, accreditation. forms of assessment. All types of standardization. Standardization. Right. Well, I think yeah. um, I would agree with that. Would anyone else agree with that? Show of hands. If you think standardization of testing should, or standardized testing should go. There's a few people, anyway. Um, who thinks it should stay? There's a few, one or two. <laughs> Maybe we should have a debate on that later on. Um, probably, probably online. Um, Lee, what, what's your pet hate? You pass the mic along. Don't don't hoard it, Helen. <laughs> I think um, it sort of goes along with assessment, but the this notion that you have to be at a certain spot in in a certain age. I guess why can't elementary and high school and adults certain conceptual skills? I think can be learned at different times across the lifespan. I think the issue of assessment is a complex one because I, I do believe in some sort of standards and benchmarks, but it's the implementation and the actualization of that that just gets totally messed up. I think so Ken board. Robinson talks about batch processing as part of an industrialization process, yeah. the factory model of schooling, which is which he, he says has right. to go. And I, that's what you're talking about, yeah. you know, the, the idea that the children don't all mature at the same time, but yet we still process them in age groups. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then we have to stream them out because then there's a problem with right. levels of attainment and so on. Um, yeah, and mine's not going to stress uh, stray too far from that. I mean, it's the filtering and the um, filtering and sorting of students in that sort of sense, and using assessment as uh, the way of doing that. And of course, that is depersonalizing the education of every student. So everyone has this all all sort of uh, 
all size, one size fits all education, which is which is a, a big issue, uh, obviously. Um, so I, I, it doesn't stray too much of that. Assessment, I think, is at the the core. Uh, the assessment, as we see, it. I think assessment is good, but yeah, just the type of assessment that we see. Um, I, I, and partly is because I've actually got a bunch to do right now, <laughs> a lot of the grading to do, and I can't do it on the plane because it all is internet uh, accessible. So yeah, that's part of the pet peeve at this moment. Okay, this is kind of a, a question Doug put on Twitter yesterday, actually, and you addressed it with your talk was all about being okay to fail, but he was getting quite frustrated at watching presentation after presentation going, this works, this works, this is brilliant, this is brilliant, if you try this, here's all the examples of how it works. And it was kind of, how do these things work? If you do this whole collaborative thing and you've said, you put this question out on Twitter and it'll be brilliant, what happens to all those people that it's not brilliant for? Um, because it's, yeah. Um, sorry. Um, I think that um, through using social tools with our learners, um, it's just been, it's been fantastic in terms of the way our relationships have changed because ultimately there's quite a level of there. You can't maintain some perceived power relation, uh, especially not with the blurring of the public and the private and all the rest of it. So I think part of kind of behaviour modelling in the classroom is you know, your responsibility as, you know, the... Uh, tutor, facilitator, whatever you want to call yourself, is to share your own uh, cock-ups, basically. <laughs> and I think once you do that with your learners, then they have confidence to open up to and make mistakes. So it's just about us all being part of one community, learning together, sharing our mistakes, sharing our failures. Um, I quite often do stupid things on the internet, and I don't really have much shame about it with my students, because I find that if I share it with them, it makes them much more comfortable to operate in that space. So... Yeah. That's exactly what we've tried to do with the confessional fa failure box. Um, I, some people have been in there already. I, I was first in. I looked rather furtive, you know. But has anyone else uh, been into the confessional? I know you have, John. And, oh, Oliver has as well. Uh, um, Nick, did you put your hand up then? Oh, you should. You should go in there. I'm sure you've got lots of failures to confess. <laughs> Quite a lot of students. Well, that, that's interesting, isn't it? Maybe they are less kind of um, constrained by their um, uh, feelings of, 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 of authority or whatever. Um, okay, I've got two. Uh, I'll, I'll come up to you first, and I'll come down to Linda. I was only, comment, I was only going to comment on... The, um, Speak right to it. Hello. I was only going to comment on the conversations thing. I actually did one, and then realised I hadn't pressed the right button, so I hadn't recorded it. <laughs> 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 and my confession was going to be, I've got the technology and I don't know how to use it, so... <laughs> Great. And Linda? Uh, no, I, I have not confessed anything because I, I, I think it could be too difficult to confess everything. So I prefer don't confess anything publicly. Now, uh, indeed, the, the amount of students is quite, imp is, is quite a, a huge problem right now because of... Uh, well, I'm coming from Spain. In Spain, we are raising our ratio in classrooms, uh, in primary, in secondary, and in higher education. And the politicians are saying that this is not a problem. But when you are speaking about activity and authentic learning and uh, trying to assess in an authentic manner and so on and so on, uh, the number of students that you have in a, in a classroom is quite important. So we are speaking about 90 people in a, in a high school in the university uh, classrooms, and we're speaking about 35 people in secondary school or 30 people in primary school or pre-primary school. So I think this is a, the broke between the politician's view about what is education and the, so, and the, and the bro and between reality and the future of education is quite important. So I think the question for the panel then is, how do we maintain good quality education when we've got such large groups to, to manage? Um, yeah, so I think I want to start with uh, the, I mean, w I've been involved with things like the massive open online courses, um, and one of the things that I see is that these big institutions are coming in and they're starting to really corrupt, I think, the idea of this. is It's not that we can take in more students and that we're there, you know, there's, there's less of a value for the teacher, and I think we just have to continue to maintain. We can reshape what a teacher does, but 
when it comes down, well, we can't take on more students and do this sort of thing. We can personalize education and we can make students more autonomous, but we need to keep that relationship. But the relationship itself changes. And so I think we have to be very careful with what we create in a way that it can actually be corrupted by those who feel that they can make money from it. So I think that's really, uh, so to, to redevelop education, to come up with creative ideas and so on, at the same time we have to be cognizant of the, the oppressive and corporate forces around us that will continue to take a really good idea and, and, and decide to commoditize it or, or, or uh, commodify it in, in some sense. So I think that's kind of a scary thing. So um, yeah, numbers are going to continue to cre increase as, as budgets decrease. I saw there was a, a conference yesterday or a couple days ago, I was following on Twitter, and, uh, and they were talking about how, you know, government coffers are going to continue to decrease and so corporations are going to come in and take over. And that's not going to make things better in any case. You're not, to increase efficiency and productivity in schools is not, should not be our goal um, at all. I think, I think uh, education system should be flush with money and inefficiencies. I think that's sometimes an okay thing to do sometimes, um, but it's not exactly the, uh, the politics or the economics of the time. I guess it's a frustrating one for me. My husband's a public school teacher. I used to be a public school teacher and just to see so many resources stripped away and more demands. And to me, the, the only answer is putting more money back into it from a governmental level. And, and I, I can't do that, but that's where I think this collective action and voice, that's where somehow we have to have a role to, to make that change at the governmental level. And it's not something quite honestly that that teachers are really good at being self-advocates and and very public. We we work in though we work collaboratively. We all have our own classrooms, and we're for the most part, I think, if you had to stereotype, very humble about the work that we do. And to get up on a platform and say, "I'm awesome. I deserve this." It's it's a difficult. It's a challenge for the teaching profession. So I think that's one thing that would. Can, can I ask you, Lee? I mean, you, you say we're not good advocates, and 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 yeah. uh, t the teacher's voice is quite quiet isn't it in, in society and yet we've now got the power and the potential with social media and with blogs and with various other you know widely available media tools to be able to, to, to raise mm -hmm. our voice mm -hmm. what's the answer I think that it's it, it's a slow I mean think about I was talking to Catherine earlier that this whole Twitter um, Ed Chat Ireland just started a year ago and just watching that community grow it, it's an infant still so I think as more people wield the power and start to learn that may be one of the things that can help turn that that vocal tide. Mm. And, and being in technology, we're so, oh, that, you know, why is it taking so long? Mm. It's only been a year. I mean, it's really not that long in terms of development. But the issues that we're facing in our classrooms are right now. So it's a super complex mm. issue that yeah. I would not even attempt to say if, I knew the answer. If a teacher tweets during work time and they're actually looking for a connection, they're in trouble because they tweeted during work time. Right. Like, there's that public perception that they're not doing work by connecting their students to others or because they're not I've got knowledge here's your here's knowledge that I've got and it's we've got to get away from that model rather than I'm going to find someone who knows more than me and I'm going to connect that person to that person so. um, uh, Helen, you, you it's not going to follow logically is that all right? doesn't matter, doesn't matter. No, no, it never does um, <laughs> <laughs> No, it's this issue around class sizes and it's something that I'm constantly wrestling with and quite worried about because um, the reason I love teaching so much is because of the relationships that I develop with learners and I think that if I don't have those, I'm probably not really going to enjoy my job so much. So that is a bit worrying. Um, but each year the class sizes are going up as the modules I do are being kind of rolled out. So, you know, there's this stuff, I've, the you know, all the digital identity type stuff that's kind of gone from 20 to 30 to 40 and, and next semester I'm going to have 120 students. Um, what personally I've done is to, I, I'm never going to take away, I'm never going to take the relationships out of the teaching and learning. I, I, I'm not doing that, I'd rather leave my job but um, what I've been doing now is just spending more intense time in the first four weeks to nurture those relationships and literally the whole the rest of the world can I'm not bothered I just want to be online and I want to be with my students and I think it takes about four weeks to get an understanding to know everybody you know especially when you're communicating online and then what I'm doing now is working with 
colleagues in New Zealand, Germany, France, Spain, and we're moving after about four or five weeks, we're moving into a global network, and then we become facilitators of peer learning now, whether it's through participatory media production or collaborative projects. But so they're essentially doing the same things that they would do in the classroom, but it's moving much more into a kind of networked behavior. Um, so that's my personal approach to dealing with large class size issues. There you go. Okay. We go again. Uh, thank you. Um, I'll just give you a scenario, if I may, which is uh, a, a friend of yours who you don't know from your sort of online education circles, you know, from the, the squash club or, or whatever you do, has a, a child who's coming up to their fifth birthday. And you'd like to offer a present to that child that helps them prepare for your, your, the world that you believe in for the future. What would you make or show or do or set up or buy or give time for to... To, to give your present. Yeah, I mean, that's, I mean, so, okay. Could you, could you restate that just a little bit? Um, so you're looking at what would you give a child to... Yeah, you, you want to help them prepare for your, your vision of the future. What, what yeah, would you give them? And I think what Helen says... Um, well, you said it. Yeah, very much. <laughs> I was like quoting that. you at you to remind you what you think. <laughs> okay, thank you for that. That's what connectivism is all about. It really is. Um, I would, yeah, I'm not sure... No, it's all right. You're loud enough. Oh, okay. So I wasn't sure. Um, yeah, I think I really do think the camera is is one of those important things. It just because it gives perspective. Now, whether it's going to be an iPad, I'm I'm still, to be honest, uh, in terms of the iPad itself, I'm still kind of the laptop person. But with with early grades, primary, I think the iPads are amazing. I'm currently doing. Um, we're doing a, um, a project within indigenous populations talking about treaty education in Canada and basically bringing in this sort of orality and storytelling. So anything that allows a child to tell a story, whether it's an iPad or a photograph or that sort of thing, a rich story, I think storytelling is something so underappreciated right now. And I think our children need to tell stories, our elders need to tell stories, we all need to tell our stories. That's one of the things I think that will allow us as teachers to grow and to reshape our narrative because I think right now throughout North America certainly there's a huge war on teachers and I think that's one of the things that we need to do is share our story and why education is important so I think from a very early standpoint um, I'm not saying that everything that kid does should go digital or should be on the on the internet but I think from an early day I think they need to be able to tell stories tell stories that have meaning that have emotion that resonate with others and so if that's a if that's a camera if that's a recording device that does audio I uh, like for me, I mean, my high school days are just missing because, well, for a number of reasons, but for the most part, but, but for the most part, like, I didn't have a camera through that, that time. I have, like, two photographs, and they're, like, my graduate photographs and a really bad tux and that sort of thing, but it's, that's not how I remember my high school days. But to think that children now can take photographs of everyday things, like being part of a photo-a-day project, that's been an amazing thing for me, just getting a sense of my own memory and the memory of my children and that sort of thing, and I'm hoping that it's, a, it's something for them. But for them to think early on about telling their own story. I think they need those artifacts. They need those memories. They need to also, uh, Darcy Norman uses the term mindful seeing. When you actually use a photograph, you reframe the world because you're always kind of looking at things in a different perspective because you're retelling that moment in many different ways. So I think that's really important. Give kids the power to tell story. Yeah, I think, my, I think about my nieces and nephews and what I've given them in the past. And one thing that I do with them, I guess, is related to storytelling, is we, do, we make cooking shows together. I don't live close to them, so every time we get a chance, what does Auntie Lee come and do? We make a cooking show, and we have this experience that involves the video and the audio and the storytelling. And I think that I remember back to my influential people and my aunts, and it was these one-on-one -on -one activity, making Easter eggs or things like that that I remember most closely. So I think that's what I would would give to a, a child as some sort of experience or, or involving them in anything and just showing the dedication that I have to them and the activity. Johnny, we can Okay, well, great. Um, I, I think we're going to have to call a halt to it there. It's very good questions, very thought-provoking discussion. Let's thank our panel, Alec and Lee and Helen. Yeah. Well done, guys.
Okay, um, you, you may want to stay here, you may want to go back to your seats, I don't, I don't mind, um, it's up to you. But um, this, the, 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 at this point in the, in the, in the com conference, we now draw to a close, and there's only one thing left to do, and that is to actually, before we thank everybody, is to um, do the prize draw. Now, I, there is an iPad 3 available, Alec, and I know that you don't, you're not interested in it, so you know, if, if you win it, you can give it to someone else after what you just said there. But uh, the rules are this, uh, everybody in the room but me is eligible. <laughs> This is the killer, this But yeah, I <laughs> carry on smiling. Um, and and um, what you do is you take your badges off and you put them into the box that is coming around. That's if you want to take part. <laughs> you land yard off. You lost your badge yesterday. Um, Bex wants a badge. Can anyone lend her theirs? <laughs> Just, just put it on a piece of paper. Put, put, put your name on a piece of paper and put it in there, okay? You, and Mark's going to get his badge. And while he's gone, I'll do the prize draw. <laughs> and uh, as, as we're getting the badges around, um, I'll, I'll say now, I'll say some thank yous to people because um, there have been a lot of people involved in this event, well over 20 people behind the scenes. Firstly, I'd like to thank Pete Yeoman, standing over there, who's been my right-hand man, and Jiminy Cricket. Yeah. Secondly, I'd like to thank Oliver and where is Jason? Um, Jason at the back, for the social media work they've been doing, a tremendous amount of work. Give them a round of applause as well. All the technical stuff could not have been done without the leadership of Ed Bolton at the back there. I think you'll agree it's been seamless. I don't know if Helene's around, but Helene has led our admin team. Thank you, Helene, wherever you are, and your admin team. Uh, our review panel, led by um, Cielo Dandres and Jonathan Moiser, who's not here, but um, please thank them as well for all the abstract work. And last, but by no means least, all of our student helpers in their T-shirts, these guys. Thank you all. Our keynote speakers, I'd like to thank each of those. I I'm sure you'll agree it's been a fabulous keynote lineup this, um, this week. And thank you to them and the spotlights. And also, of course, to yourselves for coming this year. This, this is a very small event in terms of the amount of, um, yeah, of, of money we try to, um, to... We don't try and make money from We just try and generate enough to sustain it for the next year because we want it to be a successful event for you to enjoy. I hope you've enjoyed it and learned something from it. Um, have, have you been inspired and have you enjoyed this event? Well, I, I hope you have, and I hope you come back next year and bring all your mates with you, your granny as well, if you like. Bring, bring everybody, because we want to fill these seats, all right? We want to make sure this is a, an event which um, has enough critical mass to keep it going for years to come. So, thank you for coming. And I'm now going to... I've still got mine, you know, just, yeah, so I'm not going to be in it. Is Mark back yet? Yeah? He's back. You've got your name in the box. And have you got your name in, Bex? Right, okay. So, um... I think, I think I'm, I'm going to have to just do this. The first prize is going to be a T-shirt. <laughs> I'm starting small and working, but yeah. Here we go. And that is Lee Graves Wolf. <laughs> you, you better come out and choose a, a T-shirt, Lee. You're going to give us some applause. <laughs> Which one do you want? And if it doesn't fit you, you can get another one from us. All right, we'll, we'll make a bigger one or a smaller one for you, depending on what your size is. Uh, another one. That's another T-shirt. Yep, here we go. Right at the bottom this time. And out it comes, and it's Jonathan Scott. Where is he? Over there. Another Pelican T-shirt. Now, um, while he's coming out to get his, I've got... Another T-shirt, yeah? Um, if it doesn't fit you again, Jonathan, then, then tell us, all right? And we'll get you another one. Um, I'm going to, in the box again, the next prize, the next three prizes are going to be Kerry Face's signed books. So the first one goes to Sally Walsh, over here. <laughs> Appropriately in the library services. <laughs> but I bet it won't go on the shelf. I bet it'll go, yeah. <laughs> okay. And two more. I'll, I'll take two more out here at, at random. Both for prizes for the book. And the first is Kelly Stone. 
Well, that's, she said she wanted a book, I think, didn't she? And, and now you've, you've met Kerry, now you've got the book. She's one of our students here. And also, Martin Berman. <laughs> Eyes over there. <laughs> Can we hand one back to him as well? Okay. And now we come to the, um, the bigger prize. This next prize is going to be uh, a 500 gig external hard drive, the Passport one, which I love so much. I've got several of them myself. Um, and that goes to Lynn Boyle. I just chuck it to a Pete. You know, they're, they're quite robust. <laughs> they're, made, they're made to last. Um, <laughs> three prizes left. The next one is going to be a Nintendo 3DS. Um, there we go. Ooh. And that goes to Theo Kuchel. Where are you? <laughs> it's a fix! <laughs> Two prizes left. The, the, next, the, the next prize, he's my glamorous assistant here. The, ne <laughs> <laughs> the next prize is, um, is a, a, a 3G Kindle. Okay. He's wanting me to pick his out, that's what it is. Yeah. And the winner is Fiona Collard. Oh, yeah. Drum roll. <laughs> Hands up who wants a, who wants um, who wants a, what do they call them again? Oh, an iPad, that's right, an iPad 3. Who wants an iPad 3? Here we go. Someone's going to go away with it. It's not going to be me, damn it. And the winner is Evan Pugh. Over there, right? <laughs> From Torquay Community College. I'm sure you'll put that to good use with your students, Seven. Right, okay. <laughs> right, well. Oh, he's going to have to um, take some photographs. He's, he's photo mad, this guy, with the camera. He's going to have to take some photographs. Um, so afterwards, he might ask those of you who have won the prizes to come down and, um, and uh, pose for them. That, all that remains for me, for me to do now is, is to say thank you very much. There are, as you go out, tickets available for you to take away with you for either a takeaway meal or a meal upstairs in one of the uh, in the refectory, um, just t take one if you need one, and uh, either have a packed lunch or have a hot meal. There's two restaurants open. There's one here and one up at Isaac's. Uh, thank you very much for coming, and I hope you've enjoyed it. Bye for now.